case is Miltiades versus Thornburg Mortgage. Is that right? Creeping versus Thornburg Mortgage. I know. It's like they're all bad. May it please the court. My name is Jesse Harrell. I'm with the law firm of Creed and Gowdy in Jacksonville. And I'm here on behalf of the appellants. I'd like to reserve five minutes sure. of my time for rebuttal. Fundamentally, before a bank is allowed to foreclose on someone's property to take their home, they have to meet a basic minimum threshold. And that threshold is showing they have the right to foreclose, that they have standing. This court said in Stone versus Bank United, that a party seeking foreclosure must present evidence that it owns and holds the note and mortgage. And here, uh, the Appley U.S. Bank failed to prove that it owned and held the note or it had standing to foreclose. At trial, U.S. Bank claimed to have standing because it was enforcing a note endorsed in blank. But that note was placed into the court file by Thornburg years before U.S. Bank ever purported to come in to, to be the successor in interest. Now a note in, endorsed in blank is negotiated through possession. Had U.S. Bank come into court possessing that note endorsed in blank, that would have been sufficient. But they never possessed it. And so this is a very different case than the Clay County Land Trust that they cited as supplemental authority because in that case the bank did come in and possess a note endorsed in blank and that is enough. But where you don't possess it, you can't have that, the negotiation. You looked like you were going to ask a question. Uh, and just as really as much of a background as anything, but yes. do I remember correctly, was Thornburg, Thornburg the original mortgagee? No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, there was a, the original mortgagee was MERS, uh, it was uh, the nominal mortgagee. Uh, right. And MERS transferred to Thornburg. the mortgage to Thornburg. Before the foreclosure action. Actually, there was testimony that okay. it was not transferred. The mortgage, at least, was not transferred okay. before the foreclosure. Um, but then we had some very vague testimony that Thornburg went into bankruptcy. No right. one really disputed that. And the question was, what happened to this note and mortgage once Thornburg went into bankruptcy? Um, U.S. Bank simply asserted that it was the successor in interest, and at trial it repeatedly said, we are the successor, we get to enforce this note because it's endorsed in blank. Had they possessed it, that would have been the right argument, but they never did because Thornburg placed that note in the court file. So absent your possession of the note, you have to show something else. Um, and this court in the BAC funding case talked about what those other types of proof could be. You could have an assignment, you could have proof of purchase, proof of an effective transfer, um, but you need to show that, that chain of title, that chain of possession, and they did not do that here. Um, and now in, in the briefs, they're saying, well, we didn't need to possess it because we were the successor in interest, and Thornburg had standing, so therefore we have standing. But we know that you have to have standing at two points during the trial, and this was the, um, the Kiefert versus Nation Star mortgage case that I cited as supplemental authority. It makes very clear that you're looking at standing at two points in time, and one is when the lawsuit is filed, and one is when the final judgment is entered. And so even if Thornburg had standing when it filed the judgment, U.S. Bank still had to have standing. It had to prove that it was the one entitled to enforce the note. And it couldn't say that it was the successor in interest based on a note endorsed in blank that it never possessed. It needed that additional evidence. Um, and well, the only evidence on this question was the testimony of the fellow from the servicer. That's correct, Mr. Crawford. And, and, and I'm sure uh, 
uh, Ms. Klein will correct me if I mischaracterize this, but I gather basically he, he said, basically testified that those were the facts, but he had no real personal knowledge of it, and he didn't really have any documents in the, his file that would back that up. That's, ab that? that's absolutely right. Um, and he had an interesting power of attorney, did he not? He had a power of attorney from Bank of America. Which is not U.S. Bank. Which is not U.S. Bank. But well, a power of attorney doesn't, you don't need a power of attorney to testify to facts you have knowledge of. That's so, correct, but you do. a power of attorney doesn't give you the ability to testify to facts you don't have knowledge of. Correct. Right? And so correct. The power of attorney here is fair, fairly irrelevant, isn't it? it? It just, he was arguing it gave him the authority to pursue this action uh, or to authority speak on behalf of. Authority given by someone who, whose own standing was still up questionable. Correct, right. well, because the power of attorney was from Bank of America Correct. that referenced this Thornburg Mortgage Securities Trust 2007-3, but never said what notes were even in that trust. So that's our first disconnect. Right. We don't even know that the Creedon note and mortgage are part of that trust. And then Mr. Crawford testified, first he testified at page 327, that they got the power of attorney from Bank of America because Bank of America purchased the Thornburgs security through bankruptcy. Then at 340, he said they, meaning Bank of America and the trustee, purchased it. Um, then on 340. And he, and, if I, and, and he is saying this, if I recall, because he's inferring this from the fact that they, he has the power of attorney. Correct. He doesn't have actual knowledge or documentation of. That's absolutely that. right. He, had, he initially said at 344 that there was an assignment from Thornburg to U.S. Bank, which skips the Bank of America step in there. Right. But then he admitted on recross that he had not seen that. He couldn't recall if there was such a document, and he certainly didn't have it with so him. So saying, because I have this power of attorney, that's, that must be what happened. Exactly. Okay. It's, it's an, it's, it's the an testimony was basically. nothing more right. than an inference, which is right. not confident right. substantial to prove that U.S. Bank actually owns and holds this note. And the reason that's so important is because Mr. Creedon um, could be subjected to, to another, to someone who actually does own and hold the note if we allow anyone to walk in and Let's say. Let's work the circuit court. <laughs> the circuit court, I mean, the absurdity of the position is right. Mr. Creedon himself might have come in and said, well, there's a note endorsed in blank in the court file and I purchased it out of the bankruptcy. It must and the be whole mine. Thing, the whole thing merged and now it goes away. Now it goes away. You have to have some proof that that actually happened. You can't right. just say that happened. Um, and I, I don't believe we have a very complicated argument. I think there was a total failure of proof. Um, I also provided this court with a supplemental authority from the first district, which was Lacombe versus Deutsch. And the facts were very, very similar in that case to this one. Um, you had a challenge to the sufficiency of the evidence. You had testimony from a servicer based on a power of attorney. Um, and the power of attorney listed agreements covered, but there was no evidence that the note and mortgage were part of those agreements. And then the testimony was very incoherent, which was the court's words, incoherent. Um, and it said it wasn't competent or substantial to even tend to prove Deutsch's standing. And that's exactly what we have here. We have this, well, U.S. Bank and, and Bank of America purchased it. No, Bank of America purchased it. Well, and then on 348, he was asked, well, when did U.S. Bank become owner of the mortgage? And he said he wasn't sure, but it would have been after Bank of America purchased it from Thornburg. So there's, there's no even... Even if his record somehow gave him the personal knowledge, he wasn't testifying coherently on what actually happened. And um, the One West case versus um, Bauer, which was cited um, by Appleese, it really, and uh, I know Judge Kelly, you authored that, but that really lays out the chain of title that you need to show when you have a servicer and you, you have a chain in the custody of documents. And there, not only did the servicer have possession of a note endorsed in blank, but you had this chain of documents showing the transfers, showing the power of attorneys, and testimony that actually corroborated that all that happened and when it happened. And all of that is completely missing from this. Uh, U.S. Bank was definitely on notice that this, that this was going to be challenged because when they filed their uh, notice of case status, the response said, we don't know how they're connected to this. They didn't provide us any evidence. They come in and say, we've taken over for Thornburg. And, and so they had months even after that, and they came into court, and they didn't prove their case. 
And this is the exact type of case, like in Lacombe or, um, I'm blanking on the name that I cited in my brief. Um, oh, the Korea case from this court, where it said, when a party has an opportunity to put on its proof and it fails to do that, the correct remedy is to reverse and remand with instructions that an involuntary dismissal be entered. We don't give parties a second bite at the apple to prove their case. And as I'm sure you're aware, this does not mean that my clients walk away with no mortgage or, or no note still intact, but it means that U.S. Bank has to come back and do it right if they are, in fact, the holder of the note of mortgage. Um, as to the, are there any questions on that, on that argument? Um, we don't believe you even need to reach the second argument, um, but in the event that you wanted to discuss our second point, which was that the trial court erred in allowing U.S. Bank to substitute in on the morning of the trial where there was no notice as required by 1.260 um, and where there was prejudice to my clients. It was both uh, a legal error and an abuse of discretion uh, to allow that to happen. But if the court finds that U.S. Bank failed in its proof on the first prong and that it should remand with instructions to enter the involuntary dismissal, the court does not need to end to reach the second point on appeal. Great. So if there are no more questions, I'll reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Thank you, Ms. Harrell. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Klein. Good morning. <coughs> I'm here on the, uh, behalf of the appellee in this matter, and I, I certainly do not disagree that this record could have been quite a bit clearer. Um, what I do disagree with is whether or not it's appropriate um, for this court to reverse with directions uh, to involuntarily dismiss this case. Um, the first issue that was raised on appeal was whether or not it was appropriate for the court to enter judgment um, where the plaintiff in this matter, U.S. Bank, did not possess the note. And as we set forth in our answer brief, well, at the, in, at the time Thornburg filed uh, the original complaint in this matter, it possessed the note. The note was in the court file, continued to be in the court file, and therefore um, it was legally impossible for a successor in interest thereafter to have possessed the note. Um, the issue on appeal was not simply a manifest way to the evidence argument. What it was was that specific issue. And because we have demonstrated that it was legally impossible for U.S. Bank to have uh, thereafter possessed the note, the note remained in the court file, there was uh, some semblance of testimony on behalf of Senlar, uh, Senlar's employee, who did testify that he was the servicing agent's employee for both Thornburg and for U.S. Bank. Yeah, that, but that, where does that get you? You know, I, I work for two companies, one of which is, has filed the suit but doesn't do business anymore, and the other of which I think <laughs> succeeded in interest, but I don't really have a personal knowledge of that. Well, what it I mean, gets, where does that get you? Well, what it gets us is over the the first issue on appeal, which is that the successor in interest didn't have physical possession of the note. If it's, if, uh, uh, well, yeah, the, okay. no physical possession, but then no real proof of successor in interest. That's true, but as we set forth, um, if the original claimant in the matter had standing, and that does not appear to be in dispute at any point in time. It was never raised at any point in time before the time of trial. And I and I and you say that. I mean I haven't they I haven't gone back and looked at that. I know that the the brief said that the answer and affirmative defenses were filed uh, in response to the original complaint, yes. but I haven't looked at what they were. The answer and affirmative defenses did, did not, not raise, raise a standing, standing issue. Did, right. did not. So the only time that issue came into being was in response to a motion that was filed on the first day of trial to substitute the plaintiff. So really on appeal, their beef is with the substitution of the plaintiff and not with 
the standing of the original plaintiff, Thornburg. Yeah, but now don't they get to argue the standing? They get to argue the standing of this plaintiff, correct? Well, I mean, the, except the that substitution was allowed. It, on on a motion for involuntary dismissal, there there literally has to be no evidence and no inferences that could be drawn from the evidence in order for that to be the appropriate Right, remedy. but we're talking not about Thornburg now. I, I understand. You know, I mean, we're talking, of, where are we up to? U.S. Bank at this point? We are up to well, U.S. Bank. US Bank. <laughs> and as, as difficult as Mr. Crawford's testimony was <laughs> to follow, the fact of the matter was he did appear he indicated that he was the servicing agent when Thornburg had filed uh, suit. He indicated uh, that he had a power of attorney to do what was necessary uh, to pursue the foreclosure action. And um, this court in the Stone case, Stone versus Bank United, uh, 115 Southern 3rd 411, uh, at, at least apparently indicated that sometimes testimony is sufficient to well, constitute Well, you know, and, I, and I'm not evidence. actually challenging that, but it, be, but it became, didn't it become fairly clear uh, in his testimony and, and certainly in the cross-examination that a lot of what he was testifying to was his surmise, not his knowledge, not his personal knowledge or based on, you know, documentation in the file. Well, so at that point, you know, I mean, testimony you got to have some sort of basis for the testimony, don't you? I mean, well, I, I, he did testify originally, uh, and he did change that testimony right. ultimately. That that. Murders. I mean, I know I'm giving you a hard time here, Miss Glenn, and believe me, I have stood there myself. So. <laughs> that it, he did testify that you know Murs had transferred um, right. transferred it to Thornburg. Uh, that that he was the servicing agent for Thornburg. That the original. Note was in fact in the file. Um, he identified that note. He identified the note and the mortgage, and uh, the significant evidence of, of five years worth of defaults. Um, certainly, there were some holes in his personal knowledge, but I believe that there was enough in the way of uh, documentary right. evidence, coupled with his knowledge as an employee of a servicing agent and his uh, abilities to pursue a foreclosure action either on behalf of Thornburg, the original plaintiff, or the successor. Or whoever the successor or whoever may be, it was, which may or may not be you. And, and I, I'm sure that this court has certainly um, heard from a, a lot of people in my position about the <laughs> And I, I don't want to mispronounce it, the Focht case, F-O-C-H-T, versus Wells Fargo, a recent, a recent case from just last year. And, of course, I, I'd be relying heavily on the concurring opinion, but it does appear that the majority opinion uh, was not uh, what was uh, in agreement um, with Judge Altenburn when he said, you know, look, all of these standing cases really – predated a lot of uh, what had happened during the economic downturn and all of the securitization and all of the record keeping problems um, that have occurred and really isn't the, the ultimate question. Uh, does this person um, owe this mortgage? Did this person default on this mortgage? Is there anyone else who could come in and collect on this mortgage? and? And, of course, since the uh, blank endorsement is in the court file, no one could come back against uh, the plaintiff here, I mean, the unless, defendant here. Unless there is somebody else who is actually the successor in interest to Thornburg. I mean, you know, what I'm, I think the issue, the question is, is there was really no proof that it's U.S. Bank. You know, I mean, that's the problem. Yeah. And, uh, and I agree with and you, but... So, I, so what if it's... You know, I don't know who's left. But it, uh, yeah, Wachovia, but it, or no, I, they're not left. Um, <laughs> Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo. <laughs> what if it's Wells Fargo and not U.S. Bank? Well, see, the problem is, uh, well, it's not yeah, a problem, no, actually. The judgment cancels the note. So no one in the future could have 
any possession of that note or any evidence of ownership of that note, and therefore, in reality, okay, Wells nobody... Fargo comes in and they file a, uh, motion, a petition for relief from the final judgment alleging that it is actually the successor in interest to, 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 the, to Thornburg and the note and mortgage. Well, certainly... And they, don't, they can't prove possession, obviously, but they can prove that they succeeded to the interest. And, and if they did, then they could... Have, reopen this whole have, thing. Reopen the whole thing. But the reality is that the the person who owes the money on this mortgage who's been defaulted for five years and and I understand. Uh, hasn't had to pay the taxes and insurance which the successor in interest has been paying <laughs> is not subject to any kind right. of double jeopardy, if you will. Okay. As it stands right now, the, the note is canceled. It can't be renegotiated. And isn't it more, as, as uh, Judge Altenburn observed, and, and this court certified to the Florida Supreme Court, apparently un, unsuccessfully since nobody pursued it, y isn't this more form over substance where, at the end of the day, it is undisputed that the borrower is in default? Well, yeah, again, the question is as to whom. And, and that's the problem, and, and there are reasons for those rules, and I mean, I, I know what Judge Altenburn's position is, and of course we yes. had a glut of these things, but, <clears throat> um, you know, we've had this situation before. I mean, the Great Depression, people lost their properties, they got foreclosed, these rules survived that too. And, and so it's hard, to, you know, you can, you can look down the road and, and think you've covered all the, the consequences of, you know, jettisoning these things, but... I'm not sure you have. The question I have for you, though, is what, okay, what is the argument for going back, you know, let's say we disagree with your position on the disposition of the, the merits of the case, and then the question is the remedy. And you think we should send it back for a new trial, basically. I, I, I do believe that. What am I going to say to Judge Silverman? He doesn't but, like those second bites. No, I, I understand that. And I was it's, on that. I turned, you know, I just looked. <laughs> I didn't, I was on that case. But it was, you know. uh, yeah, I, I, and I certainly understand Judge Silverman's concern, but this is sort of an unusual case. Yeah. Um, if, if the court recalls, it was only something like six weeks um, before the trial in this matter was actually held um, that there was a hearing on the notice of inactivity, and at that point... And it got set pretty quickly after it, it got set very quickly after that, and apparently not quickly enough for the trial attorney, um, for whomever the successor in interest is, <laughs> to have obtained all of the necessary documents uh, from the bankruptcy that was in Maryland. And, and, and opposing counsel was aware of this bankruptcy, as a matter of fact, at some point showed... Uh, uh, Mr. Crawford, a copy of the PACER documents. Uh, so there is certainly evidence in this record that would at least imply that there are docu documents that out something there. Something exists. That That's something true. exists. And there is also evidence of record that it, perhaps it was simply a matter of timing. But ultimately, the the only um, objection that was raised at the trial uh, to the substitution uh, on the day of trial was that uh, the borrower had insufficient notice. There was no question, um, there, there was no motion to continue the trial. It was simply, I have insufficient notice, dismiss it. That was the only remedy that was requested at that point in time. But the uh, overwhelming authority is that where a substitution is improper, then the case has to be reversed and remanded for uh, further proceedings, either to demonstrate. Uh, okay. and, I, and, I, and I didn't see your argument on that. But, but assume that we, we um, don't get to that question. But, but agree with the appellant, you know, we agree with the appellant on the first point. Do we remand for a new trial when we, if we determine that the plaintiff didn't prove its case? Well, I guess it depends on why this court would reach 
that conclusion. If it was because um, the substitution was improper, which is the, the basically the the primary grounds for their appeal in this well, case, if we, then if you we, still have Thornburg. We, you know, and it's in, it's in, it's in, it's kind of angels on the head of a pen. Right. They, if you, pr if you didn't prove the standing of U.S. Bank, you didn't show that the substitution was proper. Right, yeah. and but then. The substitution can still be improper even if U.S. Bank had standing. And I think if that was the, our determination, then you know a dismissal probably wouldn't be the, wouldn't be the appropriate thing. But if we determine that U.S. Bank didn't prove its case, what do we do with that? But there, the, I I agree. But they're they've raised both arguments on yeah, appeal. I'll they understand. they they have raised both arguments on appeal. And given that this is not one of the myriad of cases out there where there's a lost note where where there isn't uh, an original note in the in the file at the time right. Right. of trial, and, and there are those issues. Um, I, I think this is uh, this is a case that's distinguishable from there. Someone, whether it be Thornburg or the successor, owns that note and mortgage. The uh, the original note and mortgage was properly surrendered to the court. It's not running right. around in the stream of commerce. And one of the two of those parties should be entitled to foreclose, especially since um, the borrower never, ever raised the issue of Thornburg standing. So I believe, it, it, you know, foreclosure is an equitable remedy at its heart. And I think it would be entirely inequitable for the borrower to obtain a windfall. Yeah, when, and, and, and touch on that. If, if this is a, an involuntary dismissal. What happens after that? Are they scot free? Well, um, as, as I understand the current state of the law, and I think that this issue is on appeal to the Florida Supreme Court, although I think it's been the law for some time, and that is that um, U.S. Bank or Thornburg or whoever has been paying all these taxes and insurance, et cetera, for the last five years might have a limitations problem with respect to certain of those to the payments. To the out-of-pockets. To the out-of-pockets. Um, it is not my understanding, and of course foreclosure is not my first language, but I, I don't believe that they can't come back and, and file another foreclosure action after a, a, another default. Since it's been in default for five years, it's, it's so, highly so likely. So it would be an involuntary dismissal for lack of standing, and they would, you wouldn't have a determination on the merits issue. Right, but that issue is before the Florida Supreme Court, so I, you know, I can't right. say what the court is ultimately going to do, but in you know, the best case scenario, um, you know, the, the borrower's not only gotten uh, free housing for five years, but they've also gotten taxes, insurance, etc., to the tune of, of six figures uh, in this. And, and for those reasons, uh, because it is an equitable remedy, I would submit that uh, the appropriate remedy would be to, if the court's going to reverse it, to remand for an evidentiary hearing or new trial on which of the two, either Thornburg, who has not uh, been disputed to have no standing, or U.S. Bank is the appropriate party to have foreclosed on this mortgage. Thank you, Ms. Clark. Thank you. Well under fire. points I wanted to pick up on. Um, the first, the equitable argument that it would be inequitable to uh, grant an involuntary dismissal. The inequity here would be to allow the possibility of someone, because we don't know who actually owns this note, to lose some payments they made, but allow someone else, but allow my clients to have their home foreclosed on with no proof that someone actually was entitled to take that from them. That's that would be inequitable, and that's why we have the standing requirements. You have to prove that you are entitled to do this. And under this court's uh, Korea versus U.S. Bank case and the recent 
first DCA case, uh, Lacombe versus Deutsch, which cited to Korea and relied on Korea, where you have a failure of proof that, you're in, that you have standing, it is the appropriate remedy is for an involuntary dismissal. U.S. Bank, uh, we talked about the, there was talk about the short time frame from when uh, U.S. Bank came in and said, hey, you're the successor, don't dismiss our lawsuit for lack of prosecution. But this lawsuit was filed in 2009. The power of attorney from Bank of America was 2010. This lawsuit sat idle for years with nobody paying attention to what was happening. And then they, they come to trial and they don't prove who owns it. They, do, they don't prove anything. But now they want another chance to fix their error of proof when this case was already four years old at the time it was tried. That's not an appropriate remedy. The appropriate remedy is the involuntary dismissal. They can come back, they can redefault the mortgage, they can get their ducks in a row, if they can, and prove who actually owns and holds this note and has standing. But they didn't do it and they shouldn't get a second opportunity to do it. Um, the, the other thing I would point out is, um, Ms. Klein said that because the note is in the file, it can't be renegotiated so nobody else can pick it up which sort of begs the question, how did U.S. Bank pick it up? <laughs> you can't, if you're saying it's in the court file and that keeps anybody else from coming in and saying it's theirs, that should keep U.S. Bank from coming in and just saying it's theirs. There needed to be some proof, which was lacking here. If your honors have no further questions, I will Thank you, Ms. take Harrell. my leave. Thank you. Thank you both very much.